If you have your Bible today, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to expand our reading a little bit there from what we have printed in your bulletin because I've changed my mind. My wife said I was entitled to do that once. <laughs> Just once. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to begin our reading with verse 18, and we'll read through verse 31, the end of the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and beginning our reading with verse 18, and reading through the end of the chapter. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made the foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God in the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. Since the children aren't here this morning, I can tell you this one to start off with. I have realized that there are four stages in every man's life. You believe in Santa Claus. You don't believe in Santa Claus. You are Santa Claus. You look like Santa Claus. I realize that most of my life is over. I think I still have some left. And I want it to be productive in whatever it is that God enables me to do. And I hope it's still a long time. But at 57 years of age, I don't really expect to live to be 114. And so now I begin stories by saying, I used to be able to, and you can fill in the blank. I used to be able to climb that tree. Now I'll rent a machine that'll put me up there where I need to get to trim it if I need to. Or better yet, I'll hire somebody to do that. When Sarah was in high school, she came home and, and mathematics never came easy for Sarah. Isn't it interesting that she marries Troy, who's an engineer and does math for fun? And she came home and she was... Uh, had a calculus class. And she asked her mother, would you help me with calculus? And the answer is no. <laughs> Dad, would you help me with calculus? Sure, I'll take a look with you. And I sat down and I opened the book and I refreshed myself a little bit on calculus. I'd had calculus many, many years before that. And so I'm reading through this book a little bit and whatever, and finally I closed the book and said, I used to be able to do that but it's been too long. 
There's been too much time that has passed in the meantime. I can't boast in my calculus skills. I can't boast in my tree climbing skills. I can't really boast in much anything except I have a big mouth and God lets me use it. The wisdom of God appears to be foolishness to men. How is it that someone, the Son of God, the Son of Man, could come and live on this earth and be the perfect example for us and lays his life down and dies at that very moment? Now, you and I have the benefit of knowing the rest of the story. But at that very moment, what looks like utter defeat? Death on a cross is really victory. Doesn't look that way to the world. It perhaps doesn't even look that way to us at times. But it is the victory of God for the newness and the refreshing nature of Christ. To the Jew, the cross was a stumbling block. How can anyone believe that God's Son would come and would be crucified by the Romans? Anyone who hangs on the tree is cursed, it says in the Old Testament. And Jesus has become that cursed one for all of us so that we're not cursed. We live under the curse until God redeems us from the curse. It's foolishness to the Jew and a stumbling block as well to the Greek. For the Greek, that which was desirable was to seek more intellectual prowess, to become smarter and smarter and to understand and understand and understand and understand. And when the Apostle Paul goes and walks through the towns and the villages, he encountered the Greeks who didn't understand why our God would give his life on the cross. In fact, on one occasion, he walks through the town and he sees the statue. The statue is dedicated to the unknown God. That seemed reasonable. That seems reasonable. We don't want to offend anybody, so we'll have a statue to all the gods that we know, and then we'll do just do one more in case there's one that we've missed. When I was in college, I took classes on world religions and found out in Hinduism, for instance, they have 360 million gods. I'm not sure who counts them. 360 million gods. That's almost a million for every day in the year. Surely, that should appear as someone who's desiring to do what is right. But here's the point. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. And the wisdom of God appears as foolishness to man. I love presidential politics. I know. Shoot me now. <laughs> I'm very disappointed many times in what we have denigrated to in our society in the area of presidential politics. 
You know, we have 117 people running for the office of president. You know, it's not quite that many, but you understand where I'm coming from. And to see all of these folks who are vying for this one position, to make less money for many of them than what they're currently making in their jobs, for why? It's the prestige and the power. Most of those folks could make that kind of money doing something else and have. Why? It's the prestige and the power. And so we have people who line up from A to Z, from every political stripe, from every group, from every whatever, and they desire to expend themselves physically, mentally, spiritually, and monetarily to run for this job. And by the time someone finally gets elected, and that will happen, I believe, that person probably needs to take a year off to catch up with themselves. You see, that's the world's wisdom. Some of you work in business or in industry and you know that the corporate ladder means that you have to climb on somebody else's back. Step on their shoulders to get to the next rung. That's the way the world does it. The world sees our society as a pyramid with the masses down below and then you gradually get up and it gets narrower and narrower until you finally reach the pinnacle. You're at the top. Whether it's in politics or in business or in industry, it's kind of how our world works. But Jesus comes and he turns that upside down. He is the one. He is the one true God. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man who comes and humbles himself even to death. The scripture says in Philippians chapter 2, even to death on the cross, he humbles himself completely. He becomes one of us. He's not born in the palace. He's born where? In a stable. He doesn't live the high life. He lives the working man's life. Joseph is a builder, a carpenter, perhaps. Jesus grew up with calluses on his hands, but with wisdom in his heart, and a desire to serve God in his life. When he begins his public ministry, He comes down to the Jordan River and he's baptized. And the Spirit of God descends upon him and the voice speaks, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Did you notice there's not a chariot waiting there to take him into Jerusalem and set him up in the high place? Did you notice that there's not a Roman legion to lift him up on their shoulders and say, here is the king of the Jews. Jesus takes that which you and I think about and desire. Helps us to understand that it's meaningless. When it comes to physical strength, I don't have much anymore. When it comes to intellectual capability, there's lots and lots of people who are smart, smarter than me. Probably the same is true for you. There are probably people who are faster or stronger. Probably people who are smarter, at least in some fields, than what you are. There's an old song of the church. Take the world. 
but give me Jesus. He humbles himself. To give his life for you, for me, and for everyone else who will trust in him. Think about that. If you must boast in something, boast in Christ. The very Son of God became the Son of Man. He lived his life and laid it down on that cross that those nails were driven into his flesh and the spear was poked into his side because he loves you. It doesn't matter whether I can throw a baseball anymore or not. I can't, by the way. Doesn't matter whether I can run a race. I never was very fast. Doesn't matter whether I can lift a lot. Doesn't matter whether I'm smart enough or not smart enough. None of those things matter. What matters is Jesus. He is foolishness to this world and wisdom for those who believe. When the Apostle Paul writes there and he says that he's foolishness to this world, it, it, it denotes a complete surrender. There's nothing held back. He gives it all for you and for me. So if we boast, let us boast in Christ. My friends, I want you to be encouraged today to know that Jesus willingly did all of these things because he loves you. Because he cares about you. Because he wants to live in relationship with you. What appears to the world as foolishness is for us life. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that in the moments when we desire to achieve for ourselves, we realize that our achievements are much like a filthy rag. That when we learn there's someone who's always learned more. We thank you for Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Oh, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus this day. Amen.